day to all. We're glad that you all took the time to spend your afternoon with us, either on YouTube or on Zoom. I hope it will be worth your while. This is Dr. Mayu Sorcedo from the Junior High School Health Services. For our year-end activity, the three health services of the Ateneo Basic Education decided to work together or in collaboration to prepare this webinar for you entitled Caring for Children of COVID-Infected Families. We all know that the COVID-19 pandemic is a global health crisis of our time. As the cases still continue to rise, many families are now getting infected. With this opportune lecture, we are hoping that somehow we can be better equipped with the know-how on what to do when it reaches your home and how to go about it. So we could prevent it from spreading among our loved ones and use simple infection control measures. May I remind you of our house rules? Kindly put your mic on mute while the session is ongoing. To avoid experiencing unstable internet connection, uh, please turn off your mic or your video. You may still submit your question through the Google form. The link is again provided on the chat box. And our speaker will try to answer as many questions as she can on her topic in the Q&A portion later. Please avoid touching the present or share screen button on your devices at this, as this will disrupt the ongoing presentation. And for the evaluation of this webinar, kindly click on the Google link, which will be posted on the chat box toward the end of the session. So before anything else, let us start off with our Philippine National Anthem. This will be followed by Dr. Arlene Balayo from the Grade School Health Services as she leads us all in prayer. Let us put ourselves in the holy presence of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we gather here today to thank you for always keeping us safe amidst this pandemic. We ask for your guidance as we listen to this webinar. May you provide our speaker, Dr. Emmy Asete Luna, the grace and wisdom that she may share the most knowledge on her specialty. May she be blessed as she continues to bring her expertise to us and to those who need it. May all of us engage with the learnings and experiences from this and be able to apply it through your own righteous way. This we pray through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Saint Ignatius de Leola, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Arlene, for your prayer for guidance. Now, to get on with the event proper, we have Dr. Marge Santos of the Senior High School Health Services to introduce our affable speaker. Good 
Good afternoon, everyone. Our speaker for this afternoon is a graduate of the University of Santo Tomas Faculty of Medicine and Surgery. She took her pediatric residency training at St. Luke's Medical Center and her fellowship at University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital and Research Institute for Tropical Medicine. Currently, she is the assistant professor at St. Luke's College of Medicine and head of the section of pediatric infectious diseases, St. Luke's Medical Center, Quezon City and BGC and Carino Memorial Medical Center. She is also a member of the Institutional Ethics Review Committee, St. Luke's Medical Center, a member of the National Verification Committee for Measles Elimination, DOH, and member of the Antimicrobial Stewardship St. Luke's Medical Center, QC, BGC, and Carino Memorial Medical Center. She was also a contributor and member of the CME Working Group, COVID-19 Clinical Case Management Module in Pediatrics 2020, and Interim Guidelines Working Group Antiviral Treatment for COVID-19, Philippine Pediatric Society and Pediatric Infectious Disease Society of the Philippines 2020. She was also a contributor and member of the CME Working Group. I'm sorry, she's also an author and co-author of several published scientific papers and a speaker in, and a speaker in many CME conventions and symposiums. Here to enlighten us on how to care for children of COVID-infected families, let us all please welcome Doctora Imelda Acetre Luna. Thank you, Marge. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. So I would just like to share. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Doctora. Doctora Mayi, guide me lang ha. I'll share the screen. There. It's up now, Doctora. Yes. So, again, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I would like to thank um, Dr. Ted Martin and Dr. Mai Salcedo for inviting me to talk here in Ateneo. So, my topic for today is taking care of children of COVID-infected families. The children is in parentheses because even as a pediatrician, with this pandemic, it's not only the child that I take care of, but I end up taking care of the whole family. With the current surge of COVID, it is infecting not just one member of the family, but the whole family. This lecture is primarily for those who opt to do home care for a COVID-infected family member instead of bringing him to a temporary treatment and monitoring facilities or the hospital. Children and the elderly since the start of the pandemic have been advised to stay home. If they do get infected with COVID, it is usually from exposure to adults who go out of the household to work or do errands. This will be the outline of my lecture, the current status of COVID in the Philippines, factors that affect transmissibility of the virus, what is the difference between isolation and quarantine, and how do we apply this in the families affected by the virus? I will also give you case scenarios that families experience and how you as a family member can help isolate and quarantine. Also, we'll be talking about caring for families infected with the virus who opt to do home isolation. And lastly, who do we call if families need assistance, those who cannot afford testing, no place to isolate or quarantine? This is the weekly cases of by date of illness from last year until April 27 of this year. We've been seeing a surge of cases since March of this year, and we attribute this primarily on the different variants of the virus. The surge in cases has resulted in hospitals being full, resulting to managing COVID cases at home. Everyone has a family member, probably a relative, a friend who has been infected by the virus. In several Viber groups or social media, we've come across daily prayers for our infected colleagues and friends who are hospitalized or who lost their lives because of COVID. Majority of COVID cases occur in the young adult population, 
20 to 50 years old. Those in the working class, children are the least affected. But if you look at the deaths on your right, majority of deaths occur from age 50 and above. Luckily, majority of illness is still mild. A few of them asymptomatic or with no symptoms. The reason I'm showing you this is because home isolation is primarily for those with mild symptoms and asymptomatic COVID. Although right now, because of the unavailability of hospitals, some are already managing even moderate COVID cases at home. I myself did this on my brother-in-law who had moderate COVID and was managed at home on oxygen. We all know that SARS-CoV-2 is spread through person to person, primarily through respiratory droplets. Transmissibility of the virus is dependent on the following. If the people involved were wearing masks during the encounter, how near was the infected person to the other? WHO and the Department of Health recommends one meter or three feet physical distancing, while the Centers for Disease Control prefers two meters or six feet apart. How long were you exposed to the infected person? Acceptable duration is 15 minutes or less, according to CDC, though some local society places it at 30 minutes. Most importantly, was the place ventilated well when you were exposed to the infected person? We all know that open air is better than enclosed space. Opting for home isolation of a COVID-infected person means that we need to have enough space. Having a limited space such as this family is not a candidate for home isolation. It is difficult to apply the principles of transmissibility in our homes. We do not wear masks at home, although the Department of Health has already recommended that people who are going out should wear masks even at home. But in general, people do not wear masks at home. We live in the same household, we eat at the same time, we sleep in the same bedroom, share the same bathroom. We stay at home for long periods of time. Our homes are considered an enclosed space, and though we have windows most of the time, these are closed to avoid dust and, and when our air, conditions, air conditioners are on. This is a household that has the three Cs, crowded, close contact setting, and enclosed space with poor ventilation. This is a very good example of how easily the SARS-CoV-2 virus can infect several people at the same time. Not all households are created equal. Some households have very limited space, like the family of A, or there may be enough space but too many household members, just like the family in letter B. When it comes to space and number of family members, it is the families of C and D who will be able to do better home isolation and quarantine. For those who cannot do home isolation because of lack of space or by choice, they are referred to temporary treatment monitoring facilities or COVID ligtas centers. Here in Quezon City, we call these HOPE facilities. These treatment facilities are open to all who are infected with mild symptoms or no symptoms. Home isolation is primarily for those with enough space at home, with own room and bathroom, and are stable. Stable meaning they should have no danger signs like difficulty of breathing, no changes in sensorium, and are able to eat and drink. If a family member is infected with COVID, be mindful that all household members may have been exposed and could potentially become ill later. Isolate the infected, quarantine the exposed. We'll discuss the difference between the two later. Children and other people can spread the virus even if they don't have symptoms. There are people who have no symptoms but already have COVID. Remember that two days before the onset of symptoms, the person is already contagious. This is the pre-symptomatic phase. Most children do not appear to be at increased risk of severe illness from COVID, but people with comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, obese, immunocompromised, or young 
or yung mahihinang immune system tend to have severe disease. We have to protect family members who are at high risk of having severe disease. Infections within a family home are usually staggered. The parent or household member who is not yet infected could take on the primary caregiver role for the children to help minimize chance of transmission. Remember that the risk of transmission is highest in the first few days of illness when the symptoms are more pronounced. So what's the difference between isolation and quarantine? May pagkakaiba ba or can they be used interchangeably? So isolation keeps someone who is infected with a virus away from others even in their home. Quarantine keeps someone who might have been exposed to the virus away from others. The goal of isolation is to separate those who are contagious or nakakahawa from those who are not yet infected. Not all of those who were exposed will get infected. That's why we need to separate them from the infected. Quarantine corresponds to the incubation period of the virus. It counts the days when the symptoms of COVID may appear. It's an observation period of 14 days. This is the basis of isolation and quarantine. The viral load is the amount of virus you get and the period of infectiousness is the time you are contagious to other people. Incubation period is the time from exposure, kung kailan ka na-expose sa taong may COVID up to the onset of COVID symptoms. The incubation period is approximately 14 days. Two days before the onset of symptoms, the viral load represented by the red line is increasing already and the patient is already infectious or contagious to other people. The viral load is very high from start of symptoms up to three to five days. Then it gradually subsides. The person is considered highly communicable or contagious two days before the start of symptoms up to three to five days from symptom onset. The PCR test during this time is highly reliable. It is best to test people with COVID when they have symptoms. Patients with severe COVID or immunocompromised may shed the virus for a longer period of time, 14 to 21 days. PCR tests may continue to be positive for several weeks or even months after COVID, or what we call the post-infectious phase, but does not mean that the person still contagious. This could just be viral remnants. We do not recommend repeating the RT-PCR test for previously infected patients because of this. Going back to isolation, we separate those who have symptoms since they are contagious and we quarantine those who were exposed to the infected person. It is during this period of observation will we know if the person exposed got infected or not. As I've said before, not all of those who are exposed will get infected. Let me share with you the recommendations of the Department of Health when it comes to isolation and quarantine. The DOH usually follows what the World Health Organization recommends. For those who have symptoms that are mild, isolation is 10 days from the start of illness, including three days of being clinically recovered with no more symptoms. Clinically recovered means that the person has no more fever and would not need paracetamol and the person feels improved and well. For those with moderate, severe, critical COVID, DOH recommends 21 days of isolation from start of symptoms, inclusive of three days of being clinically recovered and with no more symptoms. The reason for the longer period of isolation is that the virus is shed longer of those with a more severe disease. There are people who are infected with COVID but no symptoms or what we call asymptomatic. Positive sila sa PCR pero walang symptoms. For these people, we still need to isolate them for 10 days from the time you did the test. Now we go to quarantine. We quarantine close contacts or those who were exposed to the infected person who are considered close contacts. Those within three to six feet of someone who has COVID for a total of 15 minutes or more, or you provided care at home to someone who is sick with COVID 
or you had direct physical contact with a person like hugging or kissing them, or you shared eating or drinking utensils with somebody infected with COVID. That is assuming that the exposed was not wearing a mask. Remember that all members of the household are considered close contacts if a member of the household is infected with COVID. The magic number for quarantine is 14 days. This corresponds to the incubation period of the virus. All those in close contacts with an infected person should observe for signs and symptoms of COVID within this period. If you remain asymptomatic for 14 days, then it, then it means that you were not infected. For those who develop symptoms of COVID within 14 days, you need to do RT-PCR tests, you isolate yourself, and start counting as an infected person. Now let me share with you case scenarios that I usually get when I'm doing teleconsult of families infected with COVID. This will serve as your guide on how we count the period of isolation and quarantine. So for case one, we have here the father of Casey developing symptoms of fever, cough, and colds last March 31. RT-PCR done on April 1 showed a positive for SARS-CoV-2. Mother and Casey are asymptomatic. Father was isolated on April 1. The last exposure of mother and Casey to the father was April 1. When we say last exposure, it is the last day when Casey and mother were together with the father. How long should the father be isolated? We isolate him because he has symptoms and is considered contagious. If symptoms continue to be mild, we isolate him 10 days from start of symptoms. Onset of symptoms is the first day of illness, which is March 31. We isolate the father from March 31 up to April 9. April 9 is the 10th day of illness, the last day of isolation. We isolate a person from the start of symptoms, not from the date of the PCR test. How long will mother and Casey be quarantined? Mother and Casey are considered close contacts of the father since they live in the same household and they don't have symptoms yet. Quarantine is 14 days from last exposure to the father. Last day of exposure that the family were together was April 1. April 1 is considered day zero plus 14 days, so the last day of quarantine is April 15. What if the mother during quarantine suddenly develops symptoms of cough and fever on April 5? RT-PCR done on April 6 was positive. Can she now join her husband in one room? The answer is yes. Both infected people can be together in one room. So it will be Casey who will be separated from them. How long will the mother be isolated? Even if she was supposed to end quarantine on April 15, since she has now symptoms, she will start counting from day one, from start of symptoms, which is April 5. If she continues to have mild symptoms, isolate 10 days from start of symptoms. So you isolate the mother April 5 or day one of symptoms up to April 14, the 10th day of isolation. How long should Casey be quarantined now that her mother also develops symptoms? Last day of Casey being together with mother was April 6, or we count as day zero. Count 14 days from last exposure. So April 6 is day zero, plus 14 days that will be up to April 20. Her quarantine will be extended up to April 20. If Casey continues to have no symptoms until April 20, there is no need to test Casey. But during the observation period of 14 days, anytime she develops symptoms, RT-PCR should be done. Now let's go to case two. Oscar develops symptoms of cold cough, anosmia, or nawalan ng pangamoy, or agusia, nawalan ng panlasa, on April 1. RT-PCR done on the same day and was found to be positive. He isolated himself from his family on the same day, and that was April 1. 
How will you advise the close contacts of Oscar, like his family and co-workers, when it comes to quarantining and testing? Quarantine the family and co-workers for 14 days to observe signs and symptoms of COVID. April 1 is day zero or last day that the family and co-workers were exposed to Oscar. Day one of quarantine is April 2. So quarantine from April 2 up to April 15. April 15 is the 14th day of quarantine or the last day of quarantine. Any time during the 14 days that any of his close contacts develop symptoms of COVID, test with RT-PCR. If they do not develop symptoms for 14 days, there is no need to test. Testing is best done once a person develops symptoms. What if his office mate cannot wait for 14 days and would like to be tested soon? So ito yung mga pasyente na uh, hindi makapagantay at at na at at na magpa-test. So kung gustong magpa-test, you can test them day 5 to 7 from last exposure. Because we presume that by day 5, usually they will already be positive if that person was infected. So last day of exposure is April 1 or day 0. So April 6 is day 5 from last exposure. You can do RT-PCR at this time. If his office mate is RT-PCR negative, he should still observe for signs and symptoms of COVID till 14 days and that is until April 15. If during this time he develop any signs and symptoms of COVID, then he has to repeat RT-PCR testing. If, for example, one of his office mates tested positive for RT-PCR on day 5 from exposure, so the, from exposure, April 6, but he has no symptoms, since he is now COVID positive, he should be isolated. How long will he be isolated if he remains with no symptoms? It will be 10 days from the date the test was done. So April 6 was the date the RT-PCR was positive, but there were no symptoms, so that will be the day one of isolation. April 15 will be the 10th day from the test and will be the end of isolation. So just a review, when we say asymptomatic but infected, it means the person has no symptoms but is RT-PCR positive. Mild severity is presence of cough, colds, fever, but no difficulty of breathing or no signs of pneumonia. Moderate to severe is presence of cough, colds, fever, with associated shortness of breath or difficulty of breathing. Key message for isolation and quarantine. In isolation, if with symptoms, you count from the first day of symptoms. But if asymptomatic or no symptoms but RT-PCR positive, you count from the day the patient was tested. Do not count from the time the result came out. For quarantine, day zero is the last day of exposure of the infected and the exposed were together. You add 14 days from day zero. Isolation of those with mild symptoms or asymptomatic will be a temporary treatment at monitoring facilities or LIGPAS COVID centers. Home isolation or quarantine can be done if they have own room and toilet. For those with moderate to severe COVID, they should be brought to the hospital since they will need oxygen. If you decide to do home quarantine, make sure a physician is monitoring you to guide you on what to do. Most children have mild symptoms and are not admitted. For those who opt for home isolation, what can we offer? Management is purely supportive and symptomatic. The child should be provided with a balanced diet and proper nutrition, as well as adequate hydration. Antipyretics such as paracetamol may be given for fever and pain. Antibiotics should only be given if suspecting secondary bacterial pneumonia. The appropriate caregiver of the child should be a person who is in good health, non-elderly, and with no underlying comorbidities and immunocompromising conditions. If possible, they should be in a well-ventilated single room 
and if available, should use a separate bathroom. Limit the patient's movements in the house and minimize shared space. Household members exposed to the infected should stay in a different room or, if that is not possible, maintain a distance of at least one meter from the child and follow strict hand hygiene. All household members should also wear a surgical mask when in the same room as the child. All household members should practice hand hygiene like hand washing or use of alcohol-based hand rub following contact with an infected child. We should also teach children how to do hand hygiene. The child should use dedicated dishes, drinking glasses, cups, eating utensils, towels, and beddings. Teach the child to cover his or her mouth and nose during coughing or sneezing using tissue, inner part of the elbow or sleeves, followed by hand hygiene. Ensure that shared spaces like the kitchen and bathroom are well ventilated by keeping windows open. Clean high-touch surfaces daily, like counters, tabletops, doorknobs, bathroom faucets, toilets, phones, keyboards, tablets, and bedside tablets. Use regular disinfecting cleaning products. Children younger than two years old should not wear masks and face shield due to the risk of suffocation. This also includes anyone who has difficulty or trouble breathing. A child who, is, who has cognitive or respiratory impairment and anyone who is unconscious or incapacitated should not wear masks also. When do you seek emergency medical attention? If there is difficulty of breathing, seizure or convulsion, progressive abdominal pain, persistent diarrhea o pagtatae o pagsusuka with poor oral intake or signs of dehydration, fever and progressing rash or a highly irritable child and worsening of symptoms. Notify the healthcare provider if the child's symptoms worsen. Other guidelines when testing at home when isolating at home include, have only one person in the household take care of the sick person. This caregiver should not be at increased risk of severe illness. Caregiver of the sick should minimize contact with other people in the household, especially those who are at increased risk for severe illness. Caregivers for the sick person should be different from a caregiver for other members of the household who are not infected. Avoid sharing personal items like phones, dishes, cups, utensils, towels, beddings, or toys with person who is sick. Do not have visitors in your home. Do not let your child play with other kids outside the household. The sick persons should stay in isolation until they meet the criteria to end home isolation. If the infected person has his own bedroom, which is the ideal, he should not go out of the room. Food will be brought to the room, wash separately infected person's utensils, separate laundry for his clothes, do not shake dirty laundry, use warm water. If need to go out on common areas, he has to wear a mask. But what if you share a bedroom with someone who is sick? Make sure that the room has good airflow. Place beds at least one to two meters or three to six feet apart. If this isn't possible, sleep head to toe. You may put a physical divider around the sick person's bed. If the home has more than one bathroom, one bathroom should be dedicated for use by the sick person. If the bathroom has to be shared by sick and well people in the home, remember that the virus can be excreted through feces. The toilet should only be flushed with the lid closed. Surfaces in the bathroom such as countertops, toilet handles, doorknobs, and other frequently touched surfaces should be cleaned with a disinfecting household cleaner after the sick person uses the bathroom. Keep your toothbrush, floss, or facial wash away from the toilet. The sick person should wear a mask when using the bathroom. If possible, make sure the bathroom has good airflow. Open a window or turn on an exhaust fan. If the sick person can clean the bathroom after using, have them clean and disinfect it after each use. If this is not possible, the caregiver should wear a mask 
and disposable gloves and wait as long as practical after the sick person has used the bathroom before going in to clean. If the parent or the sole caregiver is too ill to care for the child, look for caregiver outside of the home with whom the child can stay. The caregiver should not be someone who is at higher risk of severe illness from COVID as the child has likely been exposed to the virus. If the exposed child needs to stay in the home with an infected parent or caregiver, both parent or caregiver and the child should wear a mask while in the same room if the child is two years old and above. Try to stay three to six feet away from the child if possible and if safe. Do hand hygiene frequently either through the use of soap and water or use of hand sanitizer. Increase ventilation by opening a window in a room that you are in. Disinfect any items that you need to bring to the child, but do not disinfect food that you bring to the child. During this time, caregivers should monitor themselves for worsening of symptoms. Check the child's temperature twice a day and watch for symptoms of COVID such as fever, cough, or shortness of breath. If the child develops symptoms, call the child's healthcare provider for medical advice. If, for example, you found a temporary caregiver to your child outside your home, the child should stay inside the caregiver's home until 14 days after their last close contact with a sick person. If the child gets sick, the caregiver should then quarantine for 14 days after the last day the caregiver had contact with a sick child. Our homes are considered an enclosed space. We need proper ventilation. Without ventilation, infectious aerosols can aggregate in the air. The greater the number of infectious aerosols in the air, the greater the risk to healthy people, even if they are further than two meters away from an infectious person. Respiratory droplets are heavier and fall to the ground immediately, while aerosol is higher and floats in the air for a long period of time and can travel long distance. So ventilation is very important to remove aerosol in the air. How can we improve ventilation at home? So again, open doors and windows as much as possible. Consider using window exhaust fan if you have one. Turn on the exhaust fan in your bathroom and kitchen. Place a fan as close as possible to an open blowing outside. This fans can improve airflow. Point fans away from people. Pointing fans towards people can possibly cause contaminated air to flow directly at them. Use ceiling fans to help improve airflow in the home whether or not windows are open. For those in enclosed spaces with limited windows, consider portable high-efficiency particularly air cleaner. This picture shows you what happens to a house after being visited by an infected person. The house above has poor ventilation. No open window, no fans, no portable air cleaner. The virus remained in the air for a long period of time, even one hour after the infected person left the house. The house below has good ventilation, open window, ceiling fan, exhaust fan blowing air outside, and a portable air cleaner. The viral particles have disappeared one hour after the infected person left because of good airflow. With good ventilation, the concentration of virus particles in the air will be lower and they will leave your home faster than with poor ventilation. This slogan is from the United Kingdom to help them remember minimum public health standards. Hand stands for hand hygiene, face stands for face mask, space stands for physical distancing, and fresh air is for ventilation to replace the stale air inside our house. Our government's mantra that um, is posted in EDSA is mask hugas iwas. My husband, who is fond of rhyming words, added the word hanging labas to stand for ventilation. The Department of Health is now currently using the term airflow for ventilation. 
What do we do for mothers infected with COVID and their newborns? Women with COVID can breastfeed if they wish to do so. Mothers should cover no nose and mouth when coughing and sneezing. Wear a mask, especially when breastfeeding. Wash hands before and after touching the baby. Clean and disinfect surfaces. This is the WHO poster summary on caring for someone who is sick with COVID in the household. How to isolate a sick person, how to reduce contact with the virus, and how to take care of a sick person. What are the essentials needed when caring for an infected individual? Thermometer, with or without pulse oximeter, gloves, mask, alcohol, disinfectant, soap, and tissue paper. Paracetamol, cough and cold medications, vitamins, and other maintenance medications, water, fluids, or oral rehydrating solution. Designate in advance dishes, towels, beddings that are to be used. Emergency contact list of family, friends, drivers, healthcare providers, employers, local public health department, and other community resources. Important passwords that might come in handy, and a notebook to write down the sick person's temperature and symptoms. For those who have symptoms of COVID, who would need financial assistance for testing, for hospitalization, or for isolation or quarantine, call your birth or your Barangay Health Emergency Response Team. They can assist you in testing, monitoring symptoms, and if need to be hospitalized. If a PCR test is done on a family member and turns out to be positive, the LGU is informed by the testing laboratory. The LG will contact you and give you some advice on how to monitor symptoms, and they also offer free RT-PCR testing for all those who are exposed. The BERT can also help you look for temporary treatment monitoring facilities for those people who would want to isolate in these facilities instead of home isolation. This is an example of how the QC app help people with COVID symptoms. Other LGUs have this as well, and they can assist you in testing, monitoring symptoms, and if need to be hospitalized. These are the contact numbers that you can call for assistance. Different numbers for different LGUs. Or call 1555 for one COVID referral center. They can provide free testing for those who have symptoms of COVID, provide quarantine and isolation facilities if you need one. For those who need admission to a hospital, it will be worth calling one hospital command so they can assist you on what hospitals are available. There are also available free teleconsult centers launched by the Department of Health for COVID and non-COVID concerns. It is important that those who are doing home isolation will have a doctor monitor their symptoms through teleconsult. In summary, the surge of COVID cases is real. It is affecting not one, but the whole family and several families. Once a member of the family is infected, he should isolate while the rest of the household should quarantine. You separate the sick and the exposed to prevent further transmission of the virus. Not all household contacts will get the disease. Isolate the contagious person, quarantine the exposed or the close contact. Isolation for mild and asymptomatic is 10 days, while for moderate to severe is 21 days from symptom onset. Quarantine is 14 days from the last day of exposure. Caregiver of a child or a sick person should not be someone who is at high risk of having severe disease like those who are elderly and with comorbidities. Home isolation ideally should have an own room and a bathroom. And this is primarily for mild and asymptomatic. If with not enough space at home or by choice, you can avail of temporary treatment monitoring facilities by the government. For those doing home isolation or quarantine, observe mask, hugas, iwas, hanging labas, or air flow. Disinfect commonly touched surfaces or things. Teleconsult with a physician regarding your progress while doing home isolation. Know the emergency signs and symptoms that should prompt you to go to the hospital. 
and know the emergency numbers of your barangay or your LGUs. So this is my last slide. So we have to protect our family. Once you decide to do home isolation for COVID, we should continue to protect other members of the family from getting COVID. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. M, for graciously sharing your expertise with us on this baffling COVID-19 infection. That was a very informative and timely lecture, very practical. So I will not prolong the wait so you can learn even more things as Dr. Luna answers some of your questions that you may have pre-submitted. You may still send in your queries through the Q&A link, but it will be closed 15 minutes prior to the end of the session. Your questions shall be fielded on your behalf by Dr. Pao Santos Australia of the Great School Health Services. Thank you, Dr. Salcedo. Thank you, Dr. Emmy, for your lecture. I am Dr. Pauline Santos Estrella, and together with Drs. Arlene Pelayo and Dr. Marge Santos and Nurse Candy, we will now start with our Q&A. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, as Dr. Mai said, we have two venues that you, uh, our participants, or our audience can send their questions. So one may be through the link that is given or posted in the chat room, or you can scan in the screen. So... We'll start with our first question, Dr. Emmy. Yes. Um, how effective are the devices such as the personal air purifiers, the one po yung sa around, around the neck, and the plasma sterilizers and UV sterilizers in providing protection? And for UV ster sterilizers, is the 15-minute setting good enough or should we keep it on longer? Okay, yung mga naka, yung quintas ba yun? Ayun ba yun? Yes, I think so. Uh, yun talaga walang evidence because you are trying to purify the the environment. Tapos ang liit-liit lang ng air purifier mo. So, remember, the air purifier that you have at home, di ba may iba't-ibang sizes yan and specifically meron siyang parang uh, this air purifier is only for a room that is 15 square meter or 30 square meter. So, may specific siya yung mga air purifiers natin at home or yung mga air cleaners. Pero yung mga quintas-quintas, um, parang mahirap mo siyang i-measure kung nakaka-purify because the, the necklace is trying to purify the whole environment of the child or the person. So, there is no evidence that it helps. Uh, yung UV light, um, actually the, ano lang siya, parang additional way of somehow sterilizing. But again, um, parang ano lang siya, adjunct sa pag um, sterilize But remember, only the exposed surfaces are cleaned by that UV light. So it's not that effective. What is more effective is really cleaning the area and the, followed by disinfecting. Yung okay. ano tala, cleaning and disinfecting. Yung mga UV light, mm, medyo, pero not, the, the evidence is poor. That it, somehow it helps, but not that much. Okay, Doctor. So, again, no? so cleaning. Alam mo, plasma sterilizers. Ano yung itsura nun? Hindi <laughs> ko, ko alam yun. Ah, okay. Sige pa. Actually, hindi ko din alam. But uh, there is a question po, Doctor, here. That's how safe or risky is it to visit a dentist? Ah, uh, okay. So, actually, it's the dentist who is more at risk because she, he will be exposed to several people. But I know of dentists who parang sort of naka-PPE sila and then only one patient at a time and then um, limited time then. But um, parang if you are asking if is it safe for the dentist or is it safe for the patient i think what is important is asking oneself do you have symptoms of covid or were you exposed for the past 14 days to a person who had respiratory symptoms because if you had exposure or you already have symptoms of covid 
whether that is the patient or the or the dentist, I think dapat hindi ka na pumunta or the dentist should not work anymore. Okay? Uh, yun yung parang pinaka parang reliable to say na da, uh, kung safe ba pumunta doon. And probably, if I am the dentist, no, if I am the dentist and I'm exposed to several patients, I would have myself tested. I would have myself tested once in a while just to check if I have uh, COVID or not. Because yeah, I'll be but, exposed to, an, di ba bibig yun na nakanganga sa'yo for a long period of time? It's a very risky uh, exposure. So it's really more of the dentist na, uh, yung danger in uh, more of the dentist rather than the patient. So the patient dapat, ano rin sila, na dapat wala silang symptoms or no exposure at all to somebody with possible COVID for the past 14 days. Yeah, so parang it's being also responsible no, for yourself then na uh, parang will you be able to transfer this if you are infected also. Mm-hmm. So, okay, Doc. So this one's coming from junior high school. Um, when, um, I think this is regarding, Doc, uh, with COVID vaccine po, ha? it's different. It's not with regards to your lecture po. So when can a previously infected with COVID virus with COVID virus, receive the vaccine. Ah, okay. So, um, ito yung, uh, may, meron na kasing latest guideline. And the latest guideline says that as long as you are clinically recovered, meaning okay ka na, hindi ka na nakakahawa, approximately two weeks from the, from the time that you had the, the illness, you can already receive the vaccine. So, iba na to sa dating recommendation kasi before, it used to be 90 days. Pero wala na po yun. Binago na po yung recommendation. So, if you had COVID before, you can have yourself vaccinated as long as you are clinically recovered. Okay. That is noted, Dr. So, there is already now a new um, uh, protocol, no? Yes, Dr. So, um, this is also with regards to COVID vaccine, uh, with vaccines po then, Dr. Rano. So, since COVID vaccine is not yet available, what other, or, or diba, Dr. Rara, is the, for the vaccine is not available for children yet, I think, no, Dr. Tama po ba? Yes, yes. Apo. So, since COVID vaccine is not yet available for children, so what other vaccines like pneumonia can be helpful to decrease the risk of severe COVID? So, is PPV vaccine good for kids? I think yung pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine uh, okay. good for kids. Yeah. So, at uh, correct no, there's no vaccine, there's no COVID vaccine yet for children. Ang ang pinaka pwede is the Pfizer vaccine which you can give for 16 years old and above. And they already have studies that it can mm-hmm. be given for 12 to 14 years old. But we have to wait for talagang strong recommendation saying that pwede na siya sa 12 to 14. Now, um, when you say anong vaccine ang pwedeng to decrease the risk, actually, to decrease the risk of COVID, actually, there is none. And kailangan talaga COVID vaccine. But what is the advantage of having, uh, for example, influenza vaccine? Kasi malapit na tayong mag-flu season, right? This June, is the flu season, and right now we already have the influenza vaccine. And we are recommending that children should be given the influenza vaccine, even adults and the elderly. Why? Because the symptoms of COVID and influenza are the same. So at least mababawasan ka na ng isang sakit na pwedeng magmimik ng COVID, right? And then there are also reports in the US that some people have COVID and influenza at the same time. And it's not a good combination. So um, the influenza vaccine will not decrease the risk of COVID, but it somehow will protect you from influenza, a respiratory infection that can also lead to pneumonia. Now, yung pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, it is against uh, pneumonia. It can prevent pneumonia from the organism streptococcal pneumonia. So it's very specific for a bacteria, which is strep pneumonia. So that vaccine will 
prevent strep pneumonia in uh, pneumonia but not covid but you can have it so that it will protect you again from another another bacteria which is strep pneumonia so it's just like influenza you avail of those vaccines para kung sakali hindi siya magpatong-patong kasi pare-parehas lang ang symptoms nila which is fever cough and colds so at least you prevent other respiratory infections from infecting you. Okay. So, Doctora, read the, uh, thank you for emphasizing the vaccines po, no? But um, there's a question here regarding uh, flu vaccine. Is it also okay to be administered to COVID-recovered patients? Yes. Uh, you for COVID recovered patients, you can also give um, influenza vaccine as long as clinically recovered. Now, the question now is, um, paano kung nagbig gusto mong magpa-COVID vaccine then gusto mo rin magpa-influenza vaccine? Pwede ba silang sabay? Sa ngayon kasi, hindi pa pwedeng sabayan ang COVID vaccine. So, dapat may interval sila ng at least two weeks. So, kung magbibigay ka ng COVID vaccine, Yung influenza vaccine, ibibigay mo after two weeks. Pero to answer the question, pwede bang bigyan ang COVID recovered? Yes, as long as clinically recovered na yung patient. Okay, thank you very much. So um, so that's, uh, sabi po ni Dr. so two weeks interval from the COVID vaccine. So I guess this is also true also, Dr. with the, re the rest of the vaccines po, no? So pwede naman. Yes, uh, two weeks in all of the vaccines except meron lang exception, that is rabies vaccine. So for example, nakagat ka ng dog or ng cat. And then, uh, hindi pa two weeks, nakareceive ka ng COVID vaccine, and hindi pa two weeks, nakagat ka ng dog and cat. And you need to be vaccinated. We all know that rabies is fatal. So yun yung exception. Kung emergency yung vaccine, like rabies vaccine, and you need to have it, you, you, you can have it, even if less than two weeks. But for all other vaccines na pwede namang ihiwa-hiwalay, two weeks interval. Okay po, Dr. Um, for Dr. Ito po, meron pong isang nag, 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 parang nagtatanong about the duration of quarantine po, no? since it's, it was in your lecture also. So sabi niya, I had symptoms last set April 17, tested positive, April 20. In isolate niya, nag-isolate siya um, April 17, but considered my wife to be first contact in which she was, she isolated herself also from our children last April 21. My wife is not showing any symptoms still today. So from April 7, April 21 to ngayon is 30, so that's nine days already. So our plan is for my wife to have their RT-PCR test on May 4 to 5, while I have my RT-PCR test May 3 to 4 to confirm if this time I will have negative results. Okay, so medyo maana. Pero tama ba? Um, April 17, nagka-symptoms, no? Yes. And then, and isolate Meaning, when you say nag-isolate, naghiwalay na sila with, with, the child, with the children and wife nung April 17. Yes po. So, April 17 is day 1. So, magbibilang siya ng 10 days. So, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. So, April 26 will be the last day of isolation. Kasi mild lang, no? Tama ba? Apo. So, pwede na silang magsama ng April 27 onwards. Yung infected, hindi na kailangan ulitin ang RT-PCR test. Bakit? Kasi pwede pong mag positive pa siya up to three months. So, it doesn't mean na porke positive ka pa, nakakahawa ka pa. So, we don't uh, repeat it anymore. We just base it on how long you did isolation. And for mild symptoms, 10-day uh, of isolation is enough. For your wife, di ba na-exposed siya? So, close contact, exposure, di ba sabi natin, dapat 14 days. So kung April 17 ang last day uh, ng ano nila, no? Walang ako ng kalendaryo. <laughs> Sige po, Dr. So April 17 
yun yung last day of exposure. So that is day zero. You count 14 days. So last uh, day of quarantine of the wife is May 1. May 1. Yeah, okay. that's the 14th okay. day. Kung uh, hindi naman nagka-symptoms si wife and children, actually no need to, to test. No need to test and pwede na silang magsama. Yeah. Okay pa. Pero so kung prefer is... nilang mag-test, pwede naman mag-test si wife and children. Masasaktan lang yung lalo na yung mga bata. Pero basta 14 days, walang symptoms, even without testing, it okay na siya. Okay. Okay. I, I guess that's clear po no? with regards to isolation and quarantine. And no uh, repeat testing. No repeat. no repeat testing. Okay. Um, eto po, Doktara, medyo ano lang po with regards to statistics lang. Um, somebody is asking from the basic education, what is the data on children 12 years and below infected by COVID-19 and have we had fatalities? Okay. So actually, dun sa graph naman, talagang uh, very few... Very few children are affected. Okay, I don't have the exact numbers, pero dun sa graph makikita mo talagang konte yung um, ang children is up to 18 years old. So 18 years old and above, uh, mababa talaga siya. Um, who are the children that I? Because majority of kids are not admitted. Hindi sila na hospitalized. Who are the children that are admitted that I see? And these are the obese children. Ito yung mga uh, ang lalaki, hindi lang overweight, obese. So, they, obesity is a risk factor for severe COVID in children. And then, fatalities. I cannot tell you yung sa, again, kung nakita nyo yung graph kanina, napaka konte din. But if you ask me, uh, like, in the hospital where I work with, like, ano, um, dun sa private hospital, I had um, one, one death last year, but the, the person had leukemia and developed COVID. So what does it say? If you have an underlying disease like cancer, mas higher ang chance mo of dying. Yun. So you may mga risk factors. So kung sa matanda, yung mga may hypertension, diabetes, sila yung may higher risk of, of dying. So in general, very mild talaga ang children, except for obese children. Okay. So, kailangan na natin ano, mag-exercise. <laughs> anyway, Dr. Um, I think, I'm not sure if this is um, also with parang yung covered mo pa, but I think they are just asking your personal opinion, no? Related to that, the question na very low naman yung statistics of fatalities. Para sa iyo, Doc, um, can we now recommend the children to go back to school with all the proper protocols in place? And then, uh, what would be the good measure or standards yeah. for us to be able to say that it is already safe for the children to go back to face-to-face -face classes? So right now, because of the surge of cases, and it's nagpa-plateau lang yung cases, I would not recommend face-to-face. Um, -face, lalo na sa Lalo sa mga elementary who doesn't even know how to, you know, proper hand hygiene or covering the um, no, yung covering nose and mouth when sneezing. So, because of the surge, I wouldn't uh, recommend. Siguro okay lang dun sa mga, like, yung mga nagme-medicine. Kasi mga adults na yun. Um, and then, um, the reason, actually, aside from yung parang hindi sila na-affect, no, um, severely, I think one of the reasons is because they are all staying at home. So, hindi sila masyadong uh, exposed ba sa iba't ibang So, ano ko na kahit konti lang yung na-affect na kids, pag nag-open up tayo, baka naman dumami sila. So, right now, I would not recommend face-to-face uh, -face classes. Okay. Parang it's too dangerous. Na. O nga, kapag uh, yung mga estudyante pa naman, lalo na yung mga grade school, no? At talaga nagyakap, they miss each other so much, no? <laughs> Parang baka magyakapan and all. Yeah, Tapos, di ba may mga asthmatic? Uh, you know, asthma is also a risk factor for severe disease. So, nahirap 
Maraming nahihika, maraming okay. So, pero we are four minutes left po for our Q&A, Doc. So, will you be considered a close contact if you are oh. together in the car for more than 15 minutes but wearing a mask and the driver is positive? There are passengers in the passenger seat and back seat. So, if you were inside, it's an enclosed space. A car is an enclosed space. Even if you are wearing mask, and you, but you stayed there for more than 15 minutes and one is positive, the chance of you having COVID is high. You are considered a close contact. Um, less pa siguro if you open the windows. Kung naka-open the windows, naka-mask ka, baka less light. But enclosed, more than 15 minutes, even without, even with a mask, you are considered a close contact. Okay. How about, Doctora, yung risk of food, grocery, or any package deliveries po? Are, there, are these possible sources of infection or exposure to SARS-CoV-2? If so, how can we further lessen the risk in case we have no other option but to have food and other goods delivered to our home? Actually, kung nakita nyo dun sa... sa actually, kung nakita nyo dun sa... sa first few slides on transmissibility of the virus it's more of wearing the mask how far were you from the person how long were you with the person and ventilation so napansin nyo walang masyado na yung sa surfaces remember last year masyado tayong ano yung kailangan yung mga surfaces linis ng linis of course it's still important but the virus die Al alam mo madali siyang mamatay pag wala na siya sa tao so it's okay, of course, to, to wash or to, to clean the surfaces. But the risk of transmission from infected surfaces is very, very low compared to respiratory or in a place with poor ventilation. So okay lang yung magpa-deliver kayo. Pag nagpa-deliver kayo, uh, hindi nyo naman kailangan i-UV light yung, yung pinabili nyo. Alam mo yung ganun, yung... Punasan nyo lang yung box or transfer the food to another container. That's enough. Walang masyadong yung, ano mo yun, yung parang UV light or we don't even recommend yung sa door. Ano nga yun, yung doormat na merong disinfectant. We don't recommend that. We don't recommend misting, disinfectant misting because it's dangerous. Because that the yun, transmission through infected surfaces is low, very, very low compared to close contact or respiratory or in a place with poor ventilation. So not, not that dangerous yung sa food or sa deliveries, not that much. Doctora, for the last minute po, um, there, ito very ano, controversial po eh, ivermectin po and the lingua for kids, for covid for COVID patients or for kids, actually? Okay, so actually, um, yung evidence for Lianhua, there, there is insufficient evidence to recommend it. Um, the ivermectin, there is also insufficient evidence to recommend it. So we don't, uh, we don't recommend um, giving ivermectin to Lianhua for children with COVID. Okay, so no recommendations yet, okay, for, yes. So, and because I wouldn't it, even, it's a, data. No, just a, uh, just a, I don't know, because I, I have friends from PGH, and they they are seeing now patients with side effects of ivermectin being admitted. They have mm -hmm. vomiting, they have diarrhea, they have neurologic symptoms. And okay. it, it's, some, it's really a concern because people are really taking it Wala, kahit ano na lang, parang because they feel it's safe. So, it's, it's, it can be dangerous and um, PGH is now seeing patients admitting them because of side effects. Yeah. So, I guess that's a caution no? for, for our audience or for, for those who are, who are listening right now. So, Dr. in the, the interest of time, thank you very much, Dr. for patiently answering all our questions. Um, we hope the listeners um, are, are have a lot of uh, learned a lot of things to, uh, from the questions and 
at the same time from your lecture po, Dr. Tara. So I now turn over the virtual group po to Dr. Tara Mayi Salset. Thank you, Dr. Tara. Thank you po. Thank you, Pao, Dr. Tara Pao. Thank you, Dr. Emmy Luna. Um, I'm sure she has um, made cl more clarifications on your concerns, even those not within the scope of her lecture. But much as we want to entertain um, more of your questions, we should be moving on to Dr. Joseph Acuna of the Junior High School Health Services to show our gratitude for Dr. M. Good afternoon, Dr. Luna. Again, we would like to thank you for sharing your time with us and allowing us to learn more on how we could provide additional care towards our children during this COVID-19 pandemic. In behalf of the Ateneo Basic Education Health Services, allow me to present to you this virtual certificate of appreciation. Ateneo de Manila University presents this certificate of appreciation to Imelda Acetre Luna, MD, FPPS, FDIDSP, for imparting her valuable knowledge and time to the Ateneo Basic Education parents and, and employees during the Basic Education Health Services webinar entitled Caring for Children of COVID-Infected Families, given on this 30th day of April, 2021. Signed, by Jaime Jose G. Nigdao, Grade School OIC Headmaster, Jose Antonio P. Salvador, Junior High School Principal, and Maria Victoria P. De Malanta, Senior High School Principal. Thank you, Dr. Jobs. May I now turn over, um, we'll be checking on Dr. Ted Martin, the head of the Grade School Health Services. So, um, in place of Dr. Ted, in behalf of the Ateneo de Manila University community, we would like to thank Dr. Emia Setra Luna for sharing her expertise and valuable time with us. It has been a very fruitful afternoon learning the different knowledge on how to take care of our children and families, especially during this pandemic. And also our dear parents, as well as all AGS, AJ, HS, AS, HS, admin, teachers, and staff for taking time out and attending this webinar. Our heartfelt thanks goes to Ms. Christine Amara, Sir Tyler Boone, Ms. Chris Elsa Frago, Sir Miki Innumerable, Sir Donald Castillo, and Sir Harrison Victores for teaching and guiding us for this webinar. Thanks to the grade school, junior high school, senior high school health services for the full support, and to Father John G., Dr. Jane Nickdow, Mr. Joni Salvador, Mrs. Bichik de Malanta, Mrs. Virgie Estevez, and to the basic ed community, thank you very much. To reminding you all of your feedback and evaluation, the evaluation form link is posted on the chat box and the QR code is flashed on the screen. We value your comments and recommendations. Let us all join forces for this one big fight to combat COVID-19. Always practice hand washing, physical distancing, wearing masks and face shield properly. Safe, stay safe, cope well, and stay healthy. Ad majorem de gloria. And with your permission, may I present to you the whole Ateneo de Manila Basic Education Health Services team who has painstakingly worked together to prepare this webinar for you. We missed you all this school year and we hope to see you on our next activities and until we all meet again on our campus, hopefully soon. Thank you. So let us end today's webinar with a prayer for our Mother Mary. May she always keep us safe under her mantle of love.